people think of getting a doctorate and they think of medical school. So they think of grueling hours, a lot of debt, and they think then they're doing this to, to have a career as a doctor for the rest of their life, like a medical doctor. And I guess like that's not what engineering is like. Welcome to Square Pegs. In this podcast, we share the experiences of neurodiverse students in academia. Sharing these experiences is very important for increasing the awareness that leads to changing the traditional education system so it becomes a more welcoming and nurturing environment for our non-traditional learners, including those with ADHD, dyslexia, autism. So please help us achieve our goal by sharing this podcast with friends and family and also please subscribe to it so when we release new episodes, you receive the notification. Today, I'm going to speak to Dr. Angela Lanning. I know Angela for a few years already. I think it was in 2016 or 17 that she joined my lab at the University of Connecticut as an undergraduate researcher. And since then, we've been working together in different contexts, first again as an undergraduate researcher, and then she joined UConn as a PhD student. And uh, recently, actually in July 2022, she finished her PhD in structural engineering. And I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation. And Ange Angela is one of those very unique individuals that in the fir first uh, conversation, uh, one realizes that, that this person is different. I mean, it's super respectful, super deep, and is a joy to talk to her. I have always enjoyed the conversation, and I'm sure we will be able to talk about a lot of interesting and informative things during this podcast. Thank you very much, Angela, for accepting this invitation. It is a Saturday morning we are doing this because uh, you started the job recently and you're very busy. And this was the only time you could make to speak to me. And I really appreciate that, that you're taking this time. So how about we start by letting you tell us a little bit about what you're doing, your new job and your your new life, essentially. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to um, speak with you this morning. I recently moved to Seattle to work with a solar development company, and my role is primarily on more of the electrical side. So right now I'm doing more electrical design work of just like solar development fields. And it's so initially, while my background's in structural, this position is a lot more electrical, and maybe in the future I will take on more structural roles. But right now I'm really enjoying I don't know, doing something different and working with people who are excited to be in the renewable energy space. And yeah. Is, is your job challenging you enough? Yeah, I think that that's one of the reasons I was excited to kind of switch more to the electrical design side of it so I could be challenged and be working on a lot of new things while learning a, about a new industry as well. I've learned a lot in the last few months and... I'm also appreciative of my managers checking in on me recently, making sure that I'm challenged, yeah. making sure that I know that once I get bored, like there's plenty more things that they have a lot of ideas for going forward and like how I can continue to be, I guess, useful and stimulated, I guess, in my job. For for someone who is listening to you, Angela, may think or wonder, you got your PhD recently in structural engineering, and now you're telling us that you're uh, working in an area that is more electrical engineering, electrical related to something that is engineering, but it's outside your field. That doesn't surprise me though at all. I mean, the way I know you, I, I, I don't know if you ever noticed or not. I mean, during your PhD, I assigned you the most challenging uh, things that I didn't know much about, and I gave you those research assignments, you ventured on your own and you went back and educated me essentially. I mean, like one of those uh, was the recent work that we did with artificial intelligence. I haven't had much exposure and essentially working with you, I was able to learn a lot. And it was interesting that like, it didn't matter if you had prior exposure, formal training or any 
background knowledge, you could just go and figure it out without any fear or hesitation. And and in, here we are. You're still like using capitalizing on your your asset to take on challenging tasks and excelling in them. And and that's very interesting for me to see that you're you're carrying it uh, over to even your job. So is is it who you are? I mean, like you know, do you know that about yourself? Do you do that consciously? I think that I didn't in grad school do it very consciously, but after I had those experiences with you, I built up a lot of confidence in my ability to jump into new things. And that helped me, I guess, have confidence in my like intellectual ability to do that. But also it taught me that I enjoy doing that and that that's a way I think that my work can stay fresh and stay exciting for me. And so once I had that confidence and I also knew that I enjoyed it, then that's definitely something I sought out in the position. I knew that I didn't want to, to rely solely on, I guess, my structural background because I didn't want to be pigeonholed into that mm -hmm. for my entire career. I really wanted to kind of show that I can do a lot of different things. So that way I have opportunity to continue kind of bounce around a little bit as mm -hmm. I might find different interests and yeah, want to maybe kind of move on and move on and see where I can be helpful in different parts of. Yeah. I'm like that to some extent. I, I really like jumping around. That is, how I can keep myself interested uh, in my job. Again, I started as a traditional structure engineer and I got to education research, neurodiversity, artificial intelligence. And here we are, I mean, doing this podcast again, like I, I still have my day job, but always I have spiced it up with something. It might seem a little like unproductive to jump around so much, but I think that is more in a traditional sense and maybe for a neurotypical person, I mean, like that kind of like productivity measure is something that should be considered fully for someone like me. If I want to keep doing the same thing for like three, four, five years after, I mean, I, I cannot stay, remain creative, honestly, after mm -hmm. a while I realize that like, I'm just delivering tasks. Uh, I'm not enjoying it much. I'm dragging myself to, to work and and spicing it up but with some new challenging kind of adventures has always helped me to keep my maintain my interest and i think it's a very adhd thing honestly when i think about it. i mean i don't know if you you associated with adhd uh the same way i do or not i mean like what do you think about that that's interesting i i also felt like i kind of got a little pushback or just question like sincere questioning from people like why would you spend so long pursuing structural engineering if that's not what you're truly passionate about. And a lot of my thoughts were, I am passionate about, I guess, learning and enjoying what I'm learning and I guess contributing. And I feel like some people f can get that out of the same thing for their entire careers. But that's, I guess, in grad school, I feel like I was, I got a lot of enjoyment out of bouncing around so much. And so that was I'm very thankful that I learned that about myself. I think that a lot of people, even those with ADHD, probably are told you can't do that in a career because that's irresponsible or you're not going to be productive long term or people won't take you seriously if you're bouncing around every few years. And I guess so they're more maybe more afraid to do that. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, I think that that's one of the things that I think grad school at least gave me credibility intellectually so they're not yeah. i don't have as much questioning of like well maybe you are trying to switch because you can't do this and it's more of like no i just want to continue to be excited i guess i haven't necessarily like connected that with my adhd i have more of just connected that with my personality which is sometimes hard to i think separate. there are aspects of that that they are textbook adhd i mean like the the risk taking for example the level of risk taking we may not realize that, but a lot of people may get really anxious doing the kind of this drastic turns. And like, uh, I, again, like I've talked to a lot of people that's like, you're crazy. I mean, like how, can, or sometimes is you're crazy. Sometimes how can you even do that? And, or aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid of failure? Aren't you afraid like this new 
adventure, black leads to failure or you regret, you know, this, the time you spend. And honestly, I mean, like, it's like taking a risk. I mean, just going for it. And I, it, it's interesting. You said something that was, that was very important. I think the key is trust that you have, you gradually build in yourself by being in the right environments that actually you, you can do this type of like crazy shifts and like you manage it and you survive it and you actually enjoy it and you come out of it with like a, a wealth of experience that you, then you can kind of invest in the next, you know, adventure. So actually this is, although we, we typically go chronologically, we start from uh, early childhood educational experiences and then we get to graduate school. But like this time, I, I think now that we are here with this our conversation, I can pose this question to you. Uh, do you think this narrative that, oh, you know, like you commit this many years to graduate education and then you come out of it and when you commit your life to it, I mean, you have to stay with it. I mean, so if you do, for example, if you get a PhD in, for example, structure engineering, that means you have to stay in the area of structure engineering forever. So if you don't think it's going to happen to you, don't do PhD. So th I think that that is the narrative out there. And I'm, I'm wondering if it is discouraging a lot of people that they know they cannot really stay in the same field for a long time to, to do graduate, uh, to go to graduate school. Uh, what, what do you think about that? I think a lot of people have a distorted view of what grad school is. And especially getting a PhD, I think largely because people think of getting a doctorate and they think of medical school. So they think of grueling hours, a lot of debt, and they think of then they're doing this to, to have a career as a doctor for the rest of their life, like a medical doctor. And I guess like that's not what engineering is like. Can you um, unpack that for someone who doesn't mm -hmm. know it? Because that that's that's very important. I've seen this confusion over and over. Please take the time to unpack that. Yes. I mean, a lot of it is it's a lot easier to get funding going to grad school for engineering. So you don't end up with a lot of debt afterward compared to getting a medical degree. So I think that that kind of changes like the cost benefit analysis of going to grad school. I guess that's the biggest thing for me is people don't understand that. So you can I, I know funding. that, but I'm asking you this question <laughs> yeah. like for, for audience to know. You didn't pay anything out of pocket when you were a PhD student, right? For your I was paid the entire time. They paid for my tu they as in various sources of funding, paid for my tuition and a stipend for living and doing research essentially. And you reminded me when you said various sources of funding, you, uh, I think it was first year that you were on research assistantship then, and then you received this super prestigious, super competitive uh, fellowship through the National Science Foundation, GRFP which is very, very difficult to get. I mean, like many, many graduate students apply for that. And and honestly, I mean, like, I don't know if I ever told you or not, I didn't expect that any of our students actually be able to get that. And you amazed me one more time uh, when you won that very prestigious fellowship and uh, that made me even more proud of you. So. Yes, I mean, like there are many sources of funding that students can use and that shouldn't be a major consideration. I'm trying to kind of like convince a lot of students that I can see that they think differently, they see things differently to come to grad school because that is actually the time that they can really use their assets compared to undergrad that essentially they go through a rigid, predefined curriculum, and there is not much room for their creativity. There is not much room for being who they are. So they, they, they are generally discouraged after finishing their undergrad degree. They're discouraged by the whole education because, and they don't want to do a few more years of that, but what they don't really know, or we, we fail to communicate that with them is that it's going to be different. I mean, like that is actually, actually, this is the, the fun part of the, the journey. If you survived it that far, you really need to consider, particularly again, non-traditional thinkers. So you have to really consider like doing some research and trying to kind of like form an identity around it and find your joy in it. So Angela, if you 
go back to your early childhood and if you tell us a little bit about your experience in during your primary school as a female student someone with ADHD think about I don't know if you're six seven year old Angela and uh, how, how was it yes yeah, so I'm the middle of three children which I think is relevant because I had an older sister and a younger brother who were very academically minded they did well in school they were pushed ahead and that kind of I guess I was in the between kind of sandwich between these two students who did very well and didn't struggle with school. I think starting in first grade, I definitely have a lot of memories of being a lot louder and talking a lot more than a lot, a lot of other students. And I wouldn't say in first grade I was struggling. It was more of I was getting in trouble for speaking too much. And that was even like within classroom discussions about topics. It was just I had a lot more energy than a lot of other students. And I think that made it harder for me to focus on tasks such as like reading. I remember a specific time when I was placed in an advanced reading group and I was really excited to be with these other students who were really good at reading. And we were taken to a table and we all had to read in a circle table by ourselves, which is an odd way to make first graders read, I think. But mm. so we're all facing each other reading different books. And I remember sitting there just kicking the other students because I, I didn't, <laughs> couldn't read looking at all these other first graders and I was just kicking them and they eventually had to move me and put me in a different table by myself. Things like that where I was excited to be recognized for doing well in school, but I also, that didn't really stop me from, I, I don't know, I had a lot of energy and- When, when you say you were louder, you mean you spoke too much? I mean like, or you Yeah, I guess opinion. louder is a is a, almost like a sexist way to say it. I don't think I was louder volume i think i spoke more frequently i that's not normal i guess for young girls and a lot of young girls are taught to like sit down and be polite and i don't know be not be the disruptor disruptors of the classroom and so a couple that times when i yeah because i mean those that who are listening to us now you you they, they 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 hear you and they will see that like actually you're quiet so what happened <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you are a quiet person. You are very calculated. You don't uh, just say random things. I've never seen that happen. Not that it is good or bad. I'm just like saying that that that's not the picture I had in mind. I mean, like it's interesting. I mean, like you're as as if you're introducing another person. Yeah, I think it was um, years of memories. Like for example, in second grade, we were being introduced decimal places, and a teacher asked a question about what happens when you add a zero behind the number, and I blurted out the wrong answer and I felt embarrassed for that and I also she reminded me we raise our hands and little interactions like that where I guess I wasn't encouraged to like speak which mm -hmm. is fine you should raise your hand that's I'm not saying that you shouldn't have to raise your hand but it's more of a lot of those little things build up to me not trusting like my natural way of speaking and I am impulsive and so I will speak sometimes if I get too comfortable I will just like speak freely and I forget and I'll interrupt so that kind of over the years made it so I do hold back a lot in discussions and I'm very careful when I speak because I don't want to just board out and be rude and interrupt people or get embarrassed and say the wrong answer, which I think kind of translated a lot into when I was in college of trying really hard not to speak. And then that means that I'm just now thinking about not saying anything. I'm just learning how to like balance that of actually being engaged and listening to lectures while the holding myself back was a difficult thing to balance. I, I want to pause here because I, I I think this is this is a very relevant challenge that a lot of neurodiverse uh, students actually they are facing. Actually it mm -hmm. emerged as one of the strong themes in one of my research projects. We we're writing a paper on that Th is this concept of self-silencing. Do you think and the way we define it is they learn how to act more like their neurotypical peers mm -hmm. to put themselves in less trouble mm -hmm. or be included. So does that resonate with you? Yes, definitely. And I think that, I mean, I'm not sure the listeners are aware of the difference in stats of being diagnosed with ADHD as like a female versus male. And it's a lot more common for males to get diagnosed or young boys than it is for young girls. 
I think a lot of that is young girls are trying to fit in a lot more and trying to like see their peers and kind of mirror what they're doing. A lot of that is subconscious when you're younger. But as you, at least as I got into college, I took a lot of effort to, I guess, behave in lectures as others were behaving and trying to make myself kind of fit into the mold, especially within engineering. A lot of engineers are, I guess, in stereotypical ways, they're quieter, more self-reserved. And so then me trying to measure myself against those people and trying to squish myself into that box maybe made it more extreme. But yeah, I definitely think that that's true. And some people may say, okay, you know, that's good. Actually, the, uh, it's it's some behavioral correction or whatever, I mean, if you want to call it. But I would disagree. I think this is, first of all, it it takes a lot of effort and mental energy subconsciously to always be aware of what you want to say rather than just being yourself and natural in the moment. And then I I suspect in the long term, it generates some anxiety, depression, and like it, it's erosive to the sense of belonging in some way when you're always, you feel, always actively filtering yourself and trying to either emulate someone else or fit in the mold of like what is a good student behaving that way, you know, so... What what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, sure, it's good in the moment for the teacher, I guess, maybe. But f- even, I mean, if it's done in a productive way, if there's space for it in classrooms to be able to speak more freely and to be able to have more open dialogue, I think that that's how a lot of good ideas are brought up or even how more interesting discussion about topics happen. And I guess, constantly being able or having to, in classroom settings, think about when is it appropriate to speak? I mean, even in college, (laughs) so many times of saying, trying to hold back, this is not an appropriate time to speak. A lot of that is just distracting. So I'm not actually gaining information. And yes, it's building anxiety of why is it so difficult for me? And, And also confusion of how other students can just sit through lectures and absorb all the information. And I'm here and yes, I'm excited by this topic, but that excitement, I guess, makes me want to discuss it and engage with it and yeah. not actually just listen to someone else tell me about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because I, I do agree with that. I'm, I'm like that. I'm either disconnected with the environment and the topic in hand, or if I'm excited, I want to be part of it, part of the co- I cannot just be excited and listen passively. That doesn't work for me. So yeah, I even sometimes I mean when you're watching a movie at home, it's just I start like explaining things or I, like <laughs> next, be, I have to be quiet. <laughs> like we're watching I'm, this, and you're like yeah, I you're too. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that self silencing definitely it in in long term is causing some of the actually mental health challenges that students may face, even if it doesn't go to go that far. It definitely has to do with lack of sense of belonging that a lot of neurodiverse, because again, like you're filtering yourself, you're trying to control yourself, not be you when you're in that environment. And when you cannot be you, that that means that you don't belong to that environment. So uh, that is kind of like some, that's the way our brain actually interprets the situation and environment, I suspect. Uh, Moving to your middle school years, tell us about that and what stands out to you from those years. Any, and also tell tell a little bit about what you were good at. What was your strength? What was your unique abilities? Also, because that that's also important to discuss. Yeah. So I think in middle school is kind of when my interests more diverged. While in elementary school, I really enjoyed reading. By the time you make it to middle school, the books you're reading are a little bit, I know, thicker, heavier, denser. And I kind of stopped enjoying reading, I guess. And mm-hmm. I also started struggling a little bit more. Well, first we'll talk about struggles, a little bit more with reading comprehension and being able to read long passages. So on the standardized test, being able to read long passages and then interpret stuff from these long passages that are about random topics. Mm-hmm. And I started struggling a lot more with those type of things, specific- specifically on standardized tests. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the flip side, I really started enjoying science and math 
I can remember learning about displacement and velocity in seventh grade and how exciting that was to me to understand the relationships between these different things and how I guess the world actually like works <laughs> and mm-hmm. how we can translate that to paper and actually understand it. And then in math, learning how to graph things, the cool different assignments my teachers gave us, just one, we had one assignment about learning how to scale plots. And we started with a small, we could pick up any picture. We had to plot the picture and then we had to apply equations to scale it to be a larger picture. So we actually had to do that manually, which I guess mm-hmm. now you can do on a computer, just like make it larger. We did that all with plots and equations and it was really fun. And I Just the fact that it works, huh? Yeah, just the fact that it actually works. And if you do it right, your picture's not distorted. It, things just work. And it was seeing it visually, I think, was a great way to teach that. And How about, that's kind uh, of when any I, outdoor activities like natural sciences, biological yes. sciences? I mean, I was always very interested in animals and, and bugs a lot growing up, mm-hmm. um, especially when I was in elementary school. I was very into bugs. I liked to collect little bugs and study them outside with microscopes and stuff, or magnifying glass at least. I don't think I've ever got me a microscope. Or as, as part of the assignment? <laughs> no, um, these, this is just what I did on my own when I was younger. My parents got me big books of bugs and I would look through and then go try to find them outside and look at them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> so so how, how come then engineering? So by the time I got to middle school, I mean, I still kind of thought I wanted to pursue biology in middle school, probably, because I thought, oh, biology is like animals, plants, bugs. I like this. It's all very interesting. And then when I got to high school, I guess I realized that biology just didn't quite fit. The way, the way it was taught was hard for me to learn that way. It was a lot of textbooks and reading and what I thought was memorization, which I'm not great at just memorizing for the sake of memorizing, whereas math was way more of you do it and you can see why it's correct. It's more like equations and it's more of a process and you can check your errors along the way, whereas biology is like, tell me what this means, like the definitions of words. So um, you had this passion and interest and it was crushed, right? during high school? Yeah, um, I wouldn't say it was, I wouldn't say there was a moment where it was crushed. I think that it was a gradual taking biology courses and just not enjoying them and then taking more math courses and it was just a lot easier. And I viewed that as, oh, I'm just naturally better at this. Therefore, like Mm -hmm. that's what I should pursue because I don't know, that's what people say. If you're naturally good at math, you have to pursue math. And I didn't really reflect on like what that meant long term, especially with like math and engineering. People praise that where if you're good at that, they say, well, you're a girl, you're good at that. This is what you have to do. And so I I, th- I don't think in the moment I thought of it as like losing out. In retrospect, I definitely think that I didn't pursue biology because I wasn't as good at, at it. And I there was it, no good at topics in the school. Not, not that. Yes. Yes, I was at- not good at in my I would did not do as well in my biology courses and they were also not as much fun <laughs> so I don't really remember a lot I just remember looking at textbooks and that's I feel like all I remember from my biology courses in high school mm-hmm. whereas I remember like specific exci- assignments for my math courses and even back to middle school and elementary school so uh do you think if the courses were more exciting you would have chosen biology over engineering. What I'm trying to get at is, I mean, you mentioned memorization and the way it was taught, textbooks Mm -hmm. and things like that. It didn't generate more excitement around this. I wonder if if it was the way it was taught or the way it was presented, uh, the way it was presented had something to do with it, with your decision and like you're losing its interest. Yes, I think that there was not a clear distinction of just because this is a lot of information that's kind of being poured upon you doesn't mean that you're not going to going to be successful as a biologist or learning biology in this field. And I don't think that there was a clear, I guess, line of what you could do with a biology degree if you wanted to pursue that in mm-hmm. college. And so I really equated biology with a lot of heavy reading, which at that point was more of an insecurity of mine, whereas math there was very little reading. So I was a lot more confident 
being in that space. And I think that if it was biology was taught in a way where I understand that you do have to understand terminology, but it needs to have, I guess, weight attached to it to understand like why it matters. More context, maybe. More context, I think would help. And also the difference between just learning something for the sake of learning it versus like actually understanding it and yeah, yeah the context of everything around it, I think is really important. And I'm not sure how they teach biology now and what's changed. So uh, I don't know if I ever asked you this or not. Do you also have dyslexia or not? I mean, I've never been diagnosed with dyslexia. And I think that a lot of the troubles I have with reading, I'm not sure if they're dyslexia or, or ADHD or just solely ADHD. So but, what was that problem? Uh, can you explain a little bit more? Um, I mean, it depends on what I'm reading. I have a lot of trouble, like, I guess, like tracking the words on the sentence, like the set, the full sentences and so making sure that I'm reading the correct spot on the page, especially as it like wraps around the next mm -hmm. line. I lose my place a lot. I mean, I'm, I've always been very bad at spelling <laughs> and very bad at reading words out loud, which I think that could tie back to dyslexia, but a lot of it is I don't know, how, I guess, how to organize all the letters. So I just make it up and just stick with that. So I'll mispronounce mm -hmm. words a lot. And then once I mispronounce it once, that's just how I see the word. So it's hard for me to kind of relearn it. Yeah. Which is funny. I There's a lot of places I feel like in Connecticut where I'll just say it wrong um, for <laughs> the entire time I live there. But it just, it's starting to sound right if I say it wrong enough times. <laughs> yeah. Who said what form is right or wrong? So I, I, I don't know what I mean. Like this is more complicated than that, but I've had a lot of those challenges also with reading and writing. And I consider myself someone with dyslexia and and it played a major role in my educational experiences. Dyslexia was more problematic than inattention due to ADHD because the way the system was set up was just like so much emphasis on reading, writing. And writing is not that you just express yourself. Writing was like everything should be perfect. I mean, from spelling to grammar, everything should be perfect. And Ironically, what was an, a major consideration what was what is the topic that you're writing about or what is the story, you know, how attractive is that, how unique is that one. So it was less attention on that and more attention on, okay, you spelled it right or wrong. I mean, like, and that, that was just like, I really didn't like that. I really didn't appreciate that. And it just the amount of time I had to spend on learning to spell things right to make sure I don't embarrass myself, I don't uh, miss points or grade, uh, my grade is not impacted by that. It was just like occupying a lot of my cognitive bandwidth at that point and was making the just the educational experience a very anxious one, if I want to put it in words. And so it, it doesn't seem that for you, it was to that level in terms of causing trouble, demand from reading and writing at least up to your high school years, right? I would say that the struggling with writing and spelling specifically became less of a big deal when I got to high school because a lot of it was typed. So we had spell checkers and so it took that pressure off. And I think that my English teachers did a good job of not putting too much weight on the grammar, which mm -hmm. meant that there were some holes in my grammar, <laughs> I guess, when I started writing <laughs> with you. But it, they, I think that they did a good job trying to teach students to approach it more holistically of like, what are we writing about? Like, what, what are the themes of your writing? So I don't, I think I struggled a lot more with reading. So that kind of translated to my writing because it was a lot of writing about what we read about. Mm -hmm. And in your high school years, how were you unique compared to your peers, your friends? I mean, in a few ways. So I, I definitely was always good at math. And so there were there were definitely other students that were good at math. But I think that I guess the difference kind of stuck out to me more when I took my calculus course in high school. We had like a combined ABBC calculus course mm -hmm. and we had a fantastic teacher who just, he, I swear, I think he could make any student pass the AP test. He was fantastic. And so we had a lot of students in the class who didn't necessarily think that they were good at math and he did a great job of 
bringing it out in them. Mm. And I think part of the reason he did that was because the way he taught, he let us come up to the board a lot. He had us present math problems and we had a lot of quick homework assignments and not a lot of like longer ones that took a week. It was like every day we just had a few things to do and it was exciting and very fast paced. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of students who kind of thought, oh, I thought I would never be good at calculus and now I'm good at it. And that's fine. Whereas I think that I was unique and I, I really loved it. And I was like, wow, this is a different side of math. And I really liked, I really liked calculus. And I loved going up to the board and presenting the problems. And I was always really excited when he came around to check homework. He said, okay, you did this one great. Go present this problem. And I think that seeing how I was energized by that course mm -hmm. showed me a different side of learning where it wasn't just like sitting and being a passive learner, it was way more interactive and that I am good at, I it guess, that side in that of environment. It. That, yeah. that your energy was appreciated and your excitement yeah. was recognized and utilized. Yeah. And I, it was a like a two period course, which I think was kind of nice because it then gave us, we had a lot more breaks throughout it because we had so much time. He understood that we can't just sit for the whole two sections. So we, moved around a lot more. And I think that that really helped me as well. I wasn't just sitting for 50 minutes or however long it was. It was a more engaging class. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the course that really kind of switched my gear to fully commit to like, okay, maybe I should do engineering. If I like calculus this much, then mm -hmm. maybe I'll like engineering. <laughs> and at, at, at what point you decided to do engineering. It was later, later on, or uh, early on in, during high school. You knew that you you want to do engineering. I think it was my senior year of high school, so pretty late mm -hmm. on. I had applied to schools, got into schools, and I think one or two of them didn't even have an engineering program, <laughs> and so I I didn't fully know that. So I think we applied in junior year, mm -hmm. um, and have to decide senior year. I think I don't really remember the timeline, but I think it took until like halfway through my senior year when I was in my calculus course to really commit to this is what I think I should do. And what about engineering was attractive to you? I didn't know a lot about it. I think it was my parents and teachers said, if you like calculus, you'll like engineering. And I believe that. <laughs> in high school, I think I did take one engineering course, but I don't have a lot of memories of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know what we learned in it. I think it was more of just 3D models of things, but... I didn't know so, a lot of what engineering so that, did. That, that wasn't the reason. Your exposure, no, the ex exposure wasn't the reason for you to choose engineering. Just because you were good at math and maybe physics, yes. you chose engineering. I think a lot of it was I got praised for being good at that. And I enjoyed okay. that. As a high schooler, I thought I'm getting praised because this is something that not everyone is good at. So I should take advantage of that. Whether that was fully conscious or not of what I was doing, I think a lot of it was based on the praise I was getting from other people. Okay, now let's slowly transition to your college years. Any memories that stand out to you? Was it overall easier, more difficult? Maybe let's separate the first two years of that and discuss it separately because because of the genet courses and like non degree related classes we are seeing a lot of uh neurodiverse students particularly like those with the adhd they don't really relate to their degree early on their freshman sophomore year because what they are taking essentially is like more physics calculus chemistry english courses genet classes so it's like, okay, I came here to, I don't know, design structures or like build bridges. Where is that? And like, you know, so, so did you have an experience like that? How was it for you? How did you navigate through? Yes. So I went to a liberal arts university, which meant that I took a lot of general ed courses. I took, I also took a philosophy course, a religion course, and then amongst other, like my general chemistry, math. I had to take a communications course, so a lot of general courses, and I didn't like them very much. I didn't do great in them. I guess the one unique thing for me is because I did do well in my AP calculus course, I was able to skip ahead in math mm -hmm. in college, which in retrospect, I wish I hadn't. I wish I had retaken the calculus courses because then it would have been easier and I would have I um, gained more confidence, I think, in my ability to I guess, perform well in a university setting. 
Whereas instead I jumped ahead to the calculus three and I did fine, but I didn't build that confidence. I think I could have. And I was also with peers that were not actually my age group. So I was not making connections with other students that I'd be spending the next four years with. I was in a course with juniors, which was challenging, I think, because they weren't my actual like peers grade level. So I definitely, so that kind of was hard because it was, I had a lot of my general classes and then my one, I guess like more saving grace course I actually enjoy was also really hard because it was a, a little bit more challenging, I think, that I should have been put into. So my first two years were difficult. I didn't do well in chemistry either. That w- was a uniquely hard course for me. I'm not yeah. sure what about it, but I couldn't quite get it the same way I could get my engineering courses. And then a lot of, I'm not sure how this is everywhere, but in my engineering, like introductory courses in college, they pushed a lot of the, a lot of students don't make it through engineering. Their retention rate's really low. A lot of people move on and do other site sorts of things and look to your left, they won't be here kind of a thing. Mm. And not necessarily in a way to scare you, but to way to say, hey, you better work to stay here because a lot of students just don't make it through the program, Mm -hmm. which is interesting because then you go to your general courses and then you don't feel the same support to make it through those general courses. And I wouldn't say they're necessarily super challenging. I think it's just with engineering, you're kind of learning a new way of approaching, I guess, school and math problems. And it's a different sort of application of math. So it's all it's all pretty new. So yeah, you're learning something very new and then you're not, I guess, being encouraged that it will get easier. Because even though the courses get harder, you it gets easier to learn it because you're more used to learning engineering. So yeah, I think the first two years were very challenging for me and I had a lot of questions of, I guess, should I do engineering? Is this yeah. actually what I'm good that, at? My question, did you ever think if it is the right major for you and again, you had no exposure to engineering and you have to make a call if that's the right degree for you or that's the right environment for you. Yeah. And it's at least where I went, The I guess like the core requirements for the school of engineering is a lot less than the other schools. So if I were to switch out of engineering, I would have to take a lot more core classes like in English or something. So they really pressure you to make a decision sooner because if you don't mm. decide, you won't be able to graduate in four years. Yeah. So there was a lot of pressure of make your decision Otherwise, you can't graduate. Yeah. And so there was a lot of pressure. I was also not officially diagnosed with ADHD until, I guess, I think it was the first semester of my freshman year. I had been like suggested to having ADHD by multiple Mm -hmm. doctors and teachers throughout the years, but I wasn't officially diagnosed until my freshman year. And so that took a lot of, I think, time to kind of work through what that meant. I think that that alleviated a lot of guilt I had for why lectures were so hard for me. Hmm. And I it took off it took off some pressure, I think. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I, I didn't know that you were diagnosed that late, actually. Somehow I had the impression that you were diagnosed before you come to to college. What was your experience going through the diagnosis and like how did it change your I mean you you started talking about that, but let's let's spend more time. I want to see like because again you you were diagnosed as an adult, so probably you could intellectualize more things than like someone who is diagnosed at at their early age in, during their childhood years. So let, let's see how it changed your perspective. What was your experience going through that? I mean, like share that if you're comfortable. Yeah, definitely. So I was actually seeing a counselor my first semester. I was struggling, I guess, with the transition and making sure I was happy and pursuing the major I had chosen. And so I was seeing a counselor on my college campus and I've been seeing her for I don't know, a few weeks and a few months. And I show up to one appointment and I was late and I was very flustered. And I showed up and I was kind of like, I apologize for being late. And I said I was getting ready and I knew I was late. And so I was really hurrying and I leave my dorm room. I shut my door. And I turn around and I don't have my keys. So I just lock myself out of my door dorm. And I'm holding a hairbrush and I'm sitting there. I'm like, why am I holding a hairbrush? But I'm late to my appointment. So I just set it down and I'm like, I'll deal with this locked out situation later. And so I show up all flustered and I tell her the story. And she kind of like sits back, looks at me and said, have you ever like considered getting tested for ADHD? I forget exactly how she phrased it, but she asked if I had ever thought about it. I sat back also and thought, how does that story tell you I have ADHD? (laughs) Um, 
And she said she'd been thinking about it for a little bit. I guess it had been brought up throughout my life, but there was never a, like a strong enough reason to get officially tested. And also my mom didn't quite understand it and didn't was scared of medication and a lot of that stuff. So really Medication or label? I don't know. I think that she pushed it as who cares if you have a label because that just gives you medication. She was against medication, so she was nervous and thought she's doing well enough in school. Like, why would she need to change? Like, it's not like she's getting bad grades. So it was just, I guess, never pursued. But part of the process of getting diagnosed, I had to go through all of my progress reports from elementary school through high school and also any doctor visits that mentioned ADHD. And so I actually found doctor reports that say, we suggest she gets tested for ADHD when I back when I was 12. And I was like, oh, I guess we just never pursued it. <laughs> um, mm. And that was at least affirming that it's not something that just one doctor saw or it's not something that, I guess, it's something that's been throughout my entire life. So it made me feel more confident that I should at least understand it better, that it was worth in investigating. But I was very, I was also self-conscious about what the label would mean mm -hmm. um, with my peers specifically. I think that I had a, a lot of connotations with ADHD being more creative and more, I guess, artsy and less like STEM-minded. Mm -hmm. And so I was nervous if I had ADHD, ADHD, maybe that really does mean I shouldn't pursue engineering, which I was very confused by because I was not conventionally like artistic or had those characteristics i thought well if i'm not good at this what am i going to pursue yeah um, interesting yeah so it was definitely a confusing process but by the end of it after it was all sorted out i think i think by the end of my like freshman year it got at least better i was more confident and where i was at but it, i think it took until my junior year to really have more confidence and yes i have adhd yes i'm pursuing engineering and those can be held at the same time and not be confusing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you you mentioned, Angela, that you stop blaming yourself, right? Or something like that. It reminds me of my own experience. I was diagnosed very late. Uh, I was 32, 33. And the impact it had, the most memorable one, after meeting with the doctor that she was pretty sure that, like, I have ADHD was that, I mean, I, I say the way, it, it, the way it felt, although it might not be nice, but I felt less stupid right there. So, because forever, I mean, like, I was thinking, like, why are there, there are subjects, topics, classes, activities that I'm just so struggling with, while others, I mean, they do it effortlessly, they can plan something, stick to it, get it done, deliver it, submit it. And like, I am the one that like, is just like such a ginormous, messy thing. I mean, like whenever it comes to something like a linear task, essentially, and a, a timed task, why the notion of time is so nonlinear for me or, <laughs> you know, or, or why out of all of these courses, like why history is the one that I have to have the lowest grade in, I mean, rather than calculus or something. So it kind of like solved or answered all of those questions right there all together. It was just like a relieving moment. I felt like less burdened by this just confusion that I always carried that like, what's going on up there? I mean, like, this, like, why is that so? I mean, like, those most challenging topics, I do very well in the exams, in the, in the, I don't know, projects, even without much of studying. And then there are topics like writing or, for example, they, that they have like heavy memorization needs. I have to just spend so much time grinding through and like finally not get a good grade out of it. So like, does that resonate with you at all? Yes, definitely. It makes me think of my experience with AP US history and when I was a junior in high school and just how much time I had to spend on this course. I took endless months of per like meticulous notes. I was in with like after school with a teacher almost every day hmm. and I just I worked so hard 
to get an A minus in this course. And I, I worked so hard and I, all I got was A minus, which is fine. I was very proud of my A minus in this course. And then I handed my notes over to a friend who was a year younger who had missed the first like two or three months of this course because she was she would switch from like a community college to going back to taking this AP course. And she was able to learn it all and then get like a high grade on the AP test after missing like three months of the course. Mm. And I was like shocked at how different it was and how we comprehend things and how hard I had to work just for that A minus let alone like not doing well on the AP test. Like that was not even in the question for me. And then for her, she just said, okay, take your notes. I can just learn this like that. Yeah. And I think that was one of the moments in high school where I just thought, maybe this is not how I learn. Like, this is just not for me and that's okay. It was hard for me to kind of separate the ADHD side of it versus like my character. And I struggled a lot with that because it felt like I was getting a diagnosis that was so close to like me and my personality. Mm -hmm. And I I think I do a better job of understanding like, it's just like, this is who I am and it's okay. It also relates to a diagnosis, but it was hard because I viewed it as a disorder. It's that in the title. It's yeah. I viewed my personality then as part of a disorder. And that was very confusing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it delayed like the relief aspect of it a Mm -hmm. little bit because it was very much tied into, well, now you, it makes sense why you're like this, but it's tied to a disorder. And it's also your personality is part of a disorder. (laughs) And and that's Mm -hmm. hard because it's not just in an academic setting that ADHD is present in my life. It's not like it's just in college or just in school. And I and I have to actually I have to be very clear, crystal clear here that like when we say, oh, we have to work harder to be able to accomplish maybe a portion of what neurotypical people may accomplish easily, it doesn't mean that like we have to work harder or actually the system is doing its job. It's just uh, at, at not at all. I'm not blaming students, not at all. I'm saying that the system is ridiculous Mm -hmm. that it is designed in a way that it has this ginormous biases against certain types of learning. Again, like Mm -hmm. we are all on this kind of cognitive abilities spectrum, general cognitive abilities spectrum. I mean, like some of us are maybe, I mean, the same is the same way that like we have your on the artistic ability spectrum. I mean, like, so, or mathematicality, I mean, like, or logic, reasoning. I mean, like, so when there is a student that is obviously strong because can reason through, can, like, excel in a lot of topics and has obvious struggles in in just very few topics, it just puzzles me that no one asks this question like why what about what is about that course that's causing so much trouble and anxiety and frustration and can we do anything about that so it's not a student that across the board is a c student or d student is struggling through everything and now history is being one of them Mm -hmm. so is there anyone sitting in our schools and looking at the entire transcript altogether and saying like how that could be that like, okay, the student is excelling in these areas and this one is causing so much trouble and like saying that can, is it about the topic? Is it about the way it's being delivered? Is it about the expectations? I think that's a very valid and necessary question that no one is asking. Yeah. Well, I guess I have two different responses. First on just the I also want to be very clear that it's not that I'm not good at history. It's that I had a hard time performing well on an arbitrary standardized test that proved to everyone that I understood history. But I think that that's something that getting diagnosed with ADHD now as an adult, I'm very comfortable engaging with history now. And I I love it. I feel very, I'm very interested in it and I will engage it in a way that I can learn better. Like I have great podcasts that I listen to that are very interesting Mm -hmm. and I now enjoy learning history and I'm not self-conscious about my, how I did in high school on this random history test. Mm -hmm. It no longer makes me insecure to think about my ability to understand history because I know it's different than my actual intellectual ability to understand history. Yeah. 
And I think that a lot of what you're saying in regards to looking at a student holistically, a lot of it, I think, comes down to resources. And there's just no one who can say, oh, okay, the student's doing well in these courses and then gets, especially where I was at, it was more like I was getting A's and I would get a, a B or it was a, it was not a big difference. So I think for them, it just wasn't a priority compared to a lot of the other bigger problems that they were dealing with student-wise. And that's probably a lot, one reason that they, my diagnosis didn't actually happen until college, just because it was, I was doing well enough and it wasn't worth it, I guess, to question anything mm -hmm. because from their standpoint, I was doing well. We can, we can certainly blame resources, Angela, but I, I, I think about this a lot these mm -hmm. days. I, I don't think resource, like lack of resources is the main cause of this problem. I, I attribute it more with mindset, a wrong mindset this deficit-based mindset that, okay, things that you are good at, you're good at, good for you. Mm -hmm. Let's pause and fix issues. I mean, like, or let, let's fix you. I mean, whenever whenever the focus turns into fixing a student by like singling out the student, putting them on a special track or like having kind of like, I don't know, tutor time, working extensively, for example, or, or, or certain programs uh, during the school that is a deficit mindset honestly yeah. rather than saying okay let's see what you're good at and let's put all the emphasis on that let's see how far we can get with that say okay you're good at that good for you let's now make you frustrated <laughs> and grind through making you good at what is not natural to you or the way it is done is not natural to you. Or let's let's look at another way of examination, testing your excitement in, uh, you say you like history. Mm -hmm. So was there, probably assessment was an issue there, right? So was mm -hmm. there another, rather than just maybe giving more time in the exam, is there another way of evaluating the student's learning? Uh, so asking this question has less to do with resources rather than mm -hmm. assuming things for a given that, okay, it's been like always like that. What else can we do? And, you know, it's just, I don't think it's a responsible way of looking at it. Uh, any, every single teacher is responsible to think about different ways that his or her students may be thinking, you know, and learning. I agree. Based on, I guess, now reflecting, I think that in this scenario with me and this history teacher, he took it upon himself to say, I will invest more time in this one student and I will be the resources to support this one student. And so he invested a lot of his time to help me do better on these tests instead of rethinking of how, like, how am I testing her? Why am I testing her like this? And is there a way that we can change this to like broader than just like, let me single-handedly try to help this one student? Yeah. And I think that that is something a lot of teachers do is they view it as like a one student thing, like one student at a time, we can make this better instead of thinking of it more broadly. Um, yeah. And on the student side, I think I got advice from a professor in college once. I was struggling doing well on tests in his course. It was an environmental course. And so I'd go in and I would review my tests afterwards and he was looking through them with me and he was like, well, everything that you did wrong is not about the concepts. It was, you forgot to, your minus, you like dropped a minus, you flip these two numbers or like, it was little things. I just kind of made a mistake in it. So I got the wrong answer. But he's like, conceptually, you were there. And he said, honestly, you should just kind of care less about these little things. Like, yeah, you maybe not get a, won't get a perfect grade every time, but it's not worth fretting about. Like you get it. And like, that's what actually matters. And he but, like sometimes like why? grades, why it was also kind of a single it. thing. I agree. It was kind of frustrating because I was like, well, I want to get the A. I want to get the best grade. And he said some his kind of point was things, other things kind of matter more at some point, which was frustrating, but it also helped me build confidence in my intellectual abilities and separate my worth from my grade, which I think a lot of students have a hard time doing. They view their worth of tied to their grades and they take the grade itself way too seriously and that holds them back from actually like learning and being confident in what they're learning 
and said they just learned how to perform well on tests. And I struggled performing well on tests, so I think I had to separate my identity from that sometimes. Yeah. Now let's, Angela, look at your junior year and senior year in college. And when you discuss that, I want you to also talk about your research experience because not all the students in college, they have research experience. And I want to know more how it changed your perspective toward education, changed your excitement, interest. And if and where I'm going with this question is if it is a good idea for those with ADHD who are even struggling classes sometimes, I mean, like to engage in doing some type of research outside classroom learning activities uh, to to keep themselves interested and excited. Yes. So I, as you mentioned previously, I spent the summer at the University of Connecticut with you doing research between my junior and senior year of undergrad. And I found this program through like it was part of the NSF RU program. And I had a professor suggest I look into NSF RU programs if I was thinking about grad school. And at that point, I was starting to consider grad school, mostly because I had a few professors suggest I might like it. And I was enjoying my courses in my junior year of college, whereas my freshman in software, I did not enjoy them. So I was thinking, okay, maybe I don't hate this. Maybe I can consider this, but not really understanding what that meant or why I would go to grad school. So for some reason, I I guess now in retrospect, I'm not sure exactly what convinced me to do the research program, but I did. And I loved it. It was very different than my courses. It was way more student-led or Mm researcher-led. So we had general goals for the summer, general problems that we had to work on, but where we took them was based on the results. It was not based on performing well at a test at the end of the summer. So it took off a lot of the pressure of, I have to study this so I can perform well. It was, let's see where this goes. And that was totally a different approach to learning. And I think that that's a problem I had in my courses was when I study, I was often interested in things that weren't exactly going to be on the test. Mm -hmm. So I had to stifle that natural curiosity of learning about the subject as a whole and kind of focus it on learning exactly what I need to do to perform well on this test, which takes a lot of like the excitement out of learning. Mm -hmm. And so when you get to research, you don't have to stop because you you're not learning for a test you're learning to actually like learn the material and learn and research and actually make progress and so it was a lot more natural i think of a way to learn that was really exciting for me it allowed me to i think just be more of myself and learn a subject way more thoroughly than i did in my courses mm-hmm. so then when i went back to my courses i could we were being taught things and I could say, oh, wow, I actually understand what you're teaching me because I watched the different grad students do these tests on actual materials. I understand what this graph is now showing. You're not mm-hmm. just teaching me this arbitrary graph and these arbitrary points on the graph. I, I saw this behavior in real time mm-hmm. and it just grounded, I think, a lot of my senior level courses in a very useful way. I mean, even if I hadn't decided to pr- pursue grad school, just getting that hands-on experience and that open-endedness, I think, gave me confidence in my abilities, but also, like I said, grounded my understanding of what was actually going on and being taught to me. Yeah. So this is interesting. I, I, I really don't like to draw clear, crisp lines between, for example, neurotypical, neurodiverse, or ADHD, non-ADHD. But what I've noticed, for example, like ADHDers tend to do and enjoy from is actually the honest structured nature of research. That that's exactly what may make a standard student nervous. Again, I've worked with with both groups uh, through years, and one interesting thing that, for example, I see over and over traditional students or tra- students that they are doing traditionally well in the system. They always come to you and say, okay, what is that exactly I need to learn here? I mean, what 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 do I need to kind of like do exactly? What is that like final graph or something that I need to plot for you? 
rather than okay go have fun with it explore and like bringing what you're excited about what we found i mean like you know so if i want to give that kind of like open-ended type of assignment to to those students actually that makes them quite nervous because they are so much used to homeworks very with very clear expectation very clear deadlines i mean by 5 p.m like on monday you need to submit and a, a kind of three port report three page report that like uh, has this content in it i mean like if we don't have that kind of solid structure it makes a segment of students actually very nervous adhders they thrive in that environment that it's just everything is up in the air. Not to that extent, but this, that they have the freedom to go and explore, have fun with it, and then come back and present their findings and ask questions that are meaningful for them to be able to continue this journey. So, um, and I'm convinced, honestly, based on like that REU program and also other research involvements that because a lot of people ask me like, okay, you're talking about this kind of, you're criticizing all the time. I mean, like the, the traditional education system, what is the alternative? And I can say for ADHD at least, I mean like research involvement can be an alternative without burning the traditional system to the ground and like mm -hmm. building it all over again. That it's already there, a lot of universities, there are research projects going on, they can join labs. I mean, like, again, like you have, they have to make sure that the faculty mentor students that they have, they work with, they have the right mindset. So they, they it doesn't kind of add more pain and suffering essentially to, to their experience. But that is when essentially they can use that exploring mind or cognitive skills that they have fully and another reason that it is, uh, and you mentioned that briefly, is the context that it builds in your mind. It's very, very important. A lot of classes that we offer, it's just like, okay, this is how you solve the problem. And that mm -hmm. is how you solve the problem. And that is it. In what context? For what? What is the bigger picture of this? I mean, like, yes. there is no mention of that. Yeah. It, and for me, for my brain to learn something, it has this kind of like global model and there are holes in it and I need to know where that hole is and okay, this is the peg for it and I, oh, it fits. If I don't know it, I don't know what to do with that peg and like I'm just yes. going to throw it away. I'm, it's not going to stay with me. It's either in the context or not. I mean like so I think the fact that research is in, is grounded in the real, in real life context, mm -hmm. it helps a lot. So I don't know if you had that experience or, I mean, you mentioned to some extent actually that helped you when you went back to your school. Yes, I, I think it's pretty surprising to me that there's this much pushback because that's also why we're in school learning engineering is so then you can go apply it in the real world where you need this actual context. It's not like in the real world to be taking tests and having to perform exactly perfectly on every single test. You, you need context and you need to be able to say, okay, this is my problem, but what if this one thing changes? Whereas on a test, they're not just going to say, okay, now let's try this. And it's a lot less malleable than the real world actually is. And so when you're taught that one way to just perform well on these one tests, and when you get into the real, real world and they're trying to switch things up, like, well, I don't know how to apply it in this other scenario because I only learned it and I only looked up how to do it in this one scenario where research, you kind of casts a wider net and you explore more and then you like solidify and so in a lot of discussions with you it was what about this and i could respond oh i looked into that and this is what it was and i don't think we should pursue that and it kind of makes it more efficient which in a classroom setting you don't need to do as much mm -hmm. but then when you get into the real world and you're working you actually do need to do that it's not Absolutely. like you're they say okay let's do this and then like things change and you need to be able to say oh i did look into this and I have a big idea of what this will do to change our capacity. And it helps with productivity and actually helps you do well in your job. It's not like it's a useless skill and just to make sure you have more confidence in yourself. Like this is actually why we're yeah. learning engineering. Yeah. So. And and let's spend some time also for uh, on your graduate experience. 
So you went back, finished your undergrad degree, and then came back to UConn as a PhD student. And you worked on, again, like we don't want to talk about the technical parts of it. It's going to be boring for our listeners, but uh, challenging, very challenging structural engineering problems and like machine learning. And, and you supported a lot of other projects related to using imaging techniques for monitoring structures or doing a live experiment, things like that. So all very challenging projects. So tell us a little bit about your experience. How was your journey? Now that it actually you had a cool off actually period of maybe six months and probably you can look back and give us like a holistic picture of how it felt like, how was your experience in general, what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it, what assets you use. So I will let you to tell us about Yes. That. Well, I, I mean, I entered my PhD program fully intending to not pursue academia afterward. So it was an interesting perspective because a lot of students at least want to be professors after PhD. And that's kind of what everyone views of like why you pursue a PhD. But surprisingly, I feel like at least half of the students who pursue it don't actually want to go, go into academia. So I don't know why we have this mindset of it's just for people who want to go into academia. Regardless, I kind of started it off with knowing I don't want to do that long term. So I was very invested, I think, in like the research side of things, because that's kind of why I was there. And that's what I was interested in. With grad school, at least with my program, you take courses, but it's they're, I guess, a fraction of what the significance of what they are in undergrad. It's like you, you're taking a couple courses a semester and they're really to support your research and they're not to prove you deserve to be in this program the way it is in undergrad. Like they're still challenging. The topics are challenging, but the professors are there to make sure that you're actually understanding. It's a different relationship and it's a different, I guess, like transaction. It's not like you're there to prove that you deserve to be in this engineering program. Like you've already done that. You're already there. There's a lot more support. They're taught in a different way, I think, is part of it. They're more open-ended, they're more project-based, and they're more relevant <laughs> to what I'm actually doing because you have a lot more choice in what you actually are taking. So I think I went into the program pretty open-minded of, I guess, the project I'll be working on, but also what I would be getting out of it. And I don't know if it was just I was young and excited to be in this to have this opportunity, but I was I was really excited to be there. And I think that I that made it so I was able to be involved in a lot of other research students' work. So it wasn't just my like project that I was invested in. I was able to support other students in the lab, which meant that I learned a lot outside of my specific research, which then in turn helped me a lot when I ended up having to work in the lab a lot. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it was especially the, the first two years where it was a lot more in person before 2020, it was just very stimulating, everything about it. Like I was excited about my research, but then also I could be invested in someone else's research. And there was a lot to do that wasn't like, you have to do this one thing by this date. It was way more, I guess, open-ended and exciting. <laughs> nice. So you, you enjoyed its flexibility and like open-endedness. That's what I'm hearing, right? Yes. While there were, like, were some lectures, of course, I had to attend, I didn't feel like I was there just to sit and pretend like I'm paying attention. All the hours I put in, if I wasn't being productive, then I like then why put in the hours? It was more of, I have to get this work done. Like, Let's make sure I'm actually doing the best to be productive and get the most out of my day. Because at the end of the day, it's my research that needs to yeah. make progress. You can't like fake the time you're putting in. Like no one's sitting behind me saying like, are you at your desk today? It was, mm -hmm. you actually need to be productive. And so that kind of required a more natural way of engaging with my work. And Let, Let's cir circle back to your current work. Again, like you got a PhD in structural engineering, although you have extensive experience with machine learning and image processing, mm -hmm. things like that. And now you're doing something that, as you said, this, it has to do more with electrical engineering. I mean, like, so... What was it at all necessary then to do a PhD in structural engineering? And like, did you benefit from that? I I know the answer, but like, I want to I want to uh, yeah. I want you to tell us like, what did that experience add to you? Essentially, what mm -hmm. doing a PhD uh, added to you who you are and like enabled you to do better today at your job? Well, kind of how I chose civil engineering was 
well, I chose engineering because I wasn't good at certain things. I was better at this. And then I chose civil engineering because I wasn't good at writing code. And I didn't want to learn how to do that. And I kind of felt like I was choosing things half based on what, what I was good at, but also half based on what I wanted to avoid. And then when I got to grad school, that kind of all fell apart because I had to do coding. <laughs> I couldn't get around that to do my structural models. Like it required coding. And then I had to write papers. I had to do a lot of reading. And so it kind of forced me to do a lot of things that I thought the engineering or civil engineering would help me avoid. And so then it kind of also broke down because of the way you learn in grad school. It kind of broke down my insecurities when it came to a lot of those topics. Mm -hmm. And I became very confident in my abilities to jump into something and learn it and then apply it to my research and be productive in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I also learned that I enjoyed doing that. And when it comes to working full-time as a structural engineer, I, I recognize that that's not what I want to do long-term, which previous to grad school, that's what I thought I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I think that getting a PhD in structural engineering was definitely worth it because it made me recognize that I guess it made me build confidence and build skills in doing a wide variety of things because it's not like I was in grad school spending the whole year designing or the whole five years designing bridges. Like that's not what grad mm -hmm. school is. It's a lot more of little pieces and even just doing large structural experiments requires a lot of wiring and coding and a lot of other skills that aren't strictly applicable to structural engineering. So I felt like a, the majority of my time was spent on a lot of different things outside of engineering. Yeah. And so I, I enjoyed those other things and I was confident in my ability to do those other things. And I thought career-wise, I would rather continue to be more multidisciplinary than mm -hmm. simply sticking to what my official degree was in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought I would be more productive and happier long-term. So. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> definitely. I mean, just if the time was needed for you to realize these things about yourself, I think it was worth it. I mean, like that's an interesting way of looking yeah, at it. Yeah, I mean, like to it... realize that career-wise, but also to build the confidence in my skills, I think is just invaluable. To really struggle through things, I think that that's something a lot of students are uncomfortable with. They want to know where they're going and they want to have equations to get there. And the ability to like sit with something and struggle and have to figure it out yourself and you can't just go look it up. You can look up what similar problems have done and people have been in similar situations, but no one's done what you're doing because that's the point of research. You're doing something different. And having that, like, un just sitting in that uncomfortable space, I think is really useful. It helped me build a lot of confidence in myself. I think it's valuable for students to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So we have to wrap up. I need to be cognizant of your weekend time. And I, again, thank you very much, Angela, for taking the time today to do this. What would be your suggestion to a middle school age kid now uh, uh, that potentially will be listening to this? Or yeah, let's start with middle school. So, and to be more specific, you can look back at your, I don't know, 12 year old self and give her some suggestions, some pieces of wisdom advice. Ooh, back to my 12-year-old self. I would say don't define yourself based on what you think you're not good at. I think that I did a lot of that when I was mm -hmm. 12 is avoid things that I thought I was not good at and move towards things I was more getting praised for being good at. And I think that exploring what you enjoy is also very important. Mm -hmm. How about college year student, 18, 19-year-old? self what would be the advice so i think that i spoke over the summer to your reu students and one of the things i think i got from that is they're very wrapped up in how they look on paper they want to make sure that they look concise and they looked focused and they have a path to help support where they want to end up and they were worried if they take on this one opportunity that that means they're giving up a different one and they're not going to look focused and they're very wrapped up in that mm. mindset. And I think that allowing yourself a little bit more flexibility to try things, actually see what you're interested in, but also it's okay to kind of jump around a little bit more and show that you're competent in different things. It's not a bad thing to, especially when you're 19, to kind of spend a summer doing something completely outside of what you think you want to do 
because you're still building skills and you're still progressing towards being a good worker or a good engineer or whatever you want to pursue. I think people are too wrapped up in learning all the technical aspects quickly. And I think that especially with engineering, that's not the only, that's definitely not the most important. Yeah, I, I, that's a very interesting point. And I, I do see that a lot actually in our new generation of students that is all about as if there is a template of a CV or resume. And what they do is just like to fill out those blanks. And I, I do see that. And rather than genuinely pursuing their interests and what really makes them excited, although it may sound crazy and not that like all the time we have to do things that are irrelevant, but if we do things thoughtfully, we learn from them. And when we mm -hmm. learn something, we can definitely put in our CV. So it's not gonna be a waste of time. It's gonna be mm -hmm. something uh, valuable knowledge that we have acquired through, even if it is failure. I mean, like we are mm -hmm. so failure averse. I mean, like our society that like, just be super careful that you shouldn't fail whatever you do. I mean, like, what if I just want to explore something and fail and learn just to ha how to stand up after I failed? What if you, can I guarantee that you're not going to ever fail in your life? <laughs> I mean, if you yeah. there are, I mean, like not necessarily when you're 28 or 29, maybe when you, it happens when you're in 50s or 60s, I mean, like, what if at that point you don't know how to cope with that or stand mm -hmm. up again and continue on? So when do we teach our kids at school to how to fail? To yeah, we don't. I mean, like one of the, <laughs> I, I used to take my, my daughter to ice skating and the first session is all about falling and standing up. Mm -hmm. They teach them how to fall and how to stand up, how to fall to not injure yourself. And mm -hmm. when you fell, how you stand up. It's super important. Yeah, and you're going to fall. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, like, it's just like you, you never fall. I mean, like, don't even think about that. Don't go there. I mean, that's miserable. That's failure. I mean, like, yeah, it's failure. Literally failure. Yeah. So doing different things. Again, like uh, the, I, I completely understand that like there are students that they really want to pursue a linear path. So that's not the universal advice, but mm -hmm. for a lot of us with ADHD, I think that maneuverability, flexibility, exploration, doing crazy things, irrelevant, irrelevant, that's how we acquire knowledge. I think Yes, I agree. Like that's how you acquire knowledge, skills, and resiliency moving through life. That's true. That's true. So let's end it here, Angela. Thank you very much again for the time you spent with me. It's very valuable. First of all, I mean, it was so good to catch up with you, to hear that you're doing so well, and only better things are lined up for you. This is just the beginning of it. I promise that your attitude, the way you look at things, what you know, the skills you have, they just put you in like better and better positions. So I make that promise to you. And before we end, I want to also ask our listeners to, if they enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to our podcast channel leave a review and share it with others. And, you know, again, it's important because we never know. I have had this experience in my life that I heard inspirational, like, sentence or a quote, or I had a positive interaction when I was in a dark mental state or, like, I was not doing well mentally, emotionally. And really, that turned things to the right direction. And so... I'm sure that there are students, there are individuals out there that listening to this and thinking a little more positively and listening to some of the success stories that came out of this rather than all failure, medication, disability, dysfunction, and all of those things, it can really have a deep impact on how people look at themselves, the education, what they can achieve, accomplish. So please, please share that with others if you liked it. And thank you very much uh, for listening to us.